Well, ever since Adolf Hitler's rise to power in Nazi Germany in the 1930s, historians have been asking, how did he do it? How did one man, powered by one party, manipulate millions of people into believing that they were a super race of human beings, they were destined to take over the world for a thousand years, and that the Jews needed to be exterminated? Experts have theories to this question. Uh, Hitler and the Nazis were masters of psychological and political manipulation. At the time, Germany was a defeated nation. They'd just been humiliated at the uh, Paris Peace Conference following World War I, and the Nazis took advantage of this vulnerability. They created a new group of enemies, the Jews, upon which they heaped all the blame for their problems. They indoctrinated their youth to believe that Jews were all dirty criminals. They created the Hitler myth, that one man and one man alone could restore them to strength. They rewrote German history, papering over their historic crimes, blaming the nations of the world for thwarting their rise to greatness. And over time, Germans bought the lies. They took a bite of the apple. Thankfully, the German march was stopped by the forces of freedom, democracy, and sanity, but not before millions of deaths. Sadly, though, the threat is not over. Our world is still filled with leaders of all kinds who just want to manipulate us for their own ends. But it's not just political snakes who lead us astray. It's the voices in our own minds manipulating us to abandon God's will. It's our so-called friends and family members luring us into dysfunction and wickedness. It's the message we receive through the media to pursue things other than God's best. Those threats are closer than Hitler, and they might even be more dangerous. And that's actually what I want to talk to you about this morning. How God's enemies manipulate us away from God's will for our lives. And I want to do that as part two of our new series here at Rooftop. Last week, Ariel kicked off chapter three, Rebellion in the Garden. It's actually our third series on the early chapters of Genesis, which is the first book of the Bible. Genesis chapter one describes the creation of the world. Genesis chapter two describes the placement of the man and woman in the Garden of Eden. And Genesis chapter three introduces the primary conflict in scripture, In verse 1 of this chapter, the verse we talked about last week, we meet a serpent who has somehow been let into the garden. Ariel introduced us to the snake who is crafty and shrewd. As we learn, it's not wrong to be crafty and shrewd. Those actually can be good things. Not all snakes are bad. Sure, most snakes are bad. We talked about Medusa and Nagini from Harry Potter. But there are good snakes, like Viper from Kung Fu Panda good snake? And the snake in the EMS symbol? Good snake? So when the snake appears in the garden, ancient Hebrew audiences would have actually wondered, is this a good snake or a bad snake? Is this Nagini or Viper? Well, this morning we find out. And this snake is most definitely Nagini, a bad snake. Let me go ahead and read the passage to you. It comes from Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, No, no, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. Nah. You won't certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God knowing good and evil. Now, the story obviously doesn't end there. A lot more happens, but we're going slowly. This is a slow walk through Genesis 3, and that gives us plenty to discuss. Before that, though, let's just go ahead and pray for God's help. Let's pray. 
Uh, Father, we depend on your wisdom and your insight to understand your will, and we depend on your strength and your courage to obey it. Bless our uh, time this morning as we learn and hopefully as we are changed uh, by uh, what you want to do in our lives. We do pray for our state uh, and pray for the violence that we've seen this past week. Our brothers and sisters in Kansas City are hurting. We pray for the victims, pray for uh, the criminals, pray for justice and healing. While we wait for your good and perfect world to be restored once again. Amen. So this is another scene you might recognize. It's typically referred to in Christian terminology as the beginning of the fall. I'm not talking about early October. I mean the moral crisis when humanity makes its first official decision to reject God's plan. As we will see, there are very stiff consequences for their decision, but how does it go down? Well, at the center of the fall was a crafty creature in the garden identified by the author as a snake or a serpent. As we discussed last week, later authors of the Bible identify this figure as Satan. Now, Satan, as you might know, is God's adversary. And his purpose, as far as we can tell in Scripture, seems to be just to create moral chaos. He wants to upend God's righteous order so that the Lord's glory is diminished and more people fail to experience the joy of righteousness, the serpent's purposes, as Jesus says in John, to steal and kill and destroy. And this is the serpent's first opportunity to do that. And he knows what he has to do. So if you remember in Genesis chapter 2, you remember that God brought the man and the woman to the Garden of Eden where they could live forever. They had access to the tree of life, which apparently produced a fruit, which produced long life. But God also warned them that while they could eat from any tree in the garden, there was one tree, there was this other tree in the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and the rules for this tree were different. As God warns the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Now... Why would it be bad to eat from this tree? Why would eating from the tree, the knowledge of good and evil, kill you? I mean, knowledge is a good thing. Wisdom is a good thing. In the Bible, knowledge of good and evil, it's wisdom, and you want wisdom. It's good to have knowledge of good and evil. That way you know how to live better. Why would it be bad to eat from the tree of life and get life? Or why would it be good to eat from the tree of life and get life, and bad to eat from the tree of wisdom and get wisdom? For that matter, why would God even put the tree there in the first place? Well, this is the question that scholars have debated forever. Uh, Some people think it's just a test. A lot of times there are perfectly good things in the world that we just can't have. And there's nothing wrong with those things. They're just not for us. But we grow stronger by resisting. That's the test. Other people think that God's prohibition against eating from the tree was temporary. So God wanted to give them wisdom eventually. He just wanted them to grow up a little bit first. You can't rush these things. We'll actually talk more about this theory next week. But it makes sense to me. It's not wrong to want wisdom. It's not wrong to grow in knowledge and even become like God. But that needs to happen in the right way at the right time, one fruit at a time. Learn how to live, and then we'll teach you how to be wise. Either way, what's interesting is that the serpent actually knows these instructions. Maybe the serpent was lying in the grass, hiding there, listening when God first told them, all these trees are for you, but here are two special trees. Eat from this tree and you will live. Eat from this tree and you will die. And the serpent sees an opportunity to lead his first humans astray. So he makes his approach. Makes his approach to the man and the woman. It's a slithery approach. Remember? He's a skilled manipulator. A shrewd operator. He doesn't just want to miss. He doesn't want to miss his opportunity. Might just get this one chance. So he waits for God to leave, and then he makes this move. Actually, he makes three moves. 
The shrewd satanic serpent employs three strategies that even Hitler can appreciate here. And I want to tell you about the serpent strategies this morning because here's the thing. He's still making them, still making his move. He's still in our gardens and our lives, leading us astray. And the best thing we can do is know how he works. So that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. The serpent's strategies. Here in this story, he has three of them. What are they? First, he fosters confusion. He fosters confusion. He creates intellectual havoc. The NIV translation of the Bible reads, The serpent said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? No, he knows that's not what God said. He misquotes God to get the woman's mind all backwards. We know what God said. He said, you can eat from any tree in the garden except this one tree. But the serpent misquotes God to the woman. In fact, in the Hebrew, it's not even really a question. He doesn't ask the woman if God really says that. He just says he did. The Hebrew literally reads, the serpent said, though God said, you must not eat from any tree in the garden. And the woman actually cuts him off. No, 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 no. No, that's not what God said. He said we could eat from any tree in the garden, just just not this one. Now, however strong the woman comes back to correct Satan, suddenly there's at least a little bit of confusion. Well, what did God say? Did he say this? Or did he say this? I mean, I thought he said this, but now this talking snake is telling me he said this. The serpent creates an opening for the man and the woman to get confused. And if there's confusion about what God exactly said, they would be more likely to interpret him to mean what they wanted him to mean. That's how this works. This is still one of the devil's favorite tactics. He creates confusion in our minds about what God's will is. Now, I want to be humble here because, I mean, some of this confusion is understandable. The Bible is not always clear. It can be confusing being a Christian. This is why we have to be humble and careful and studious. But as Paul writes to the Corinthians, our God is not a God of confusion. God wants us to understand what we need to live for him and enjoy his blessings. He doesn't want us to be confused. He doesn't want us to be confused about love and holiness and grace and Jesus and relationships and marriage and forgiveness. It's the serpent that fosters confusion in our minds and hearts. He misleads us with things that aren't true, knowing that the more confused we are, the more likely we are to choose our own way. Let me give you an example. This is an imperfect example, but it's what I have for you. I get really confused about the best way to help people on the street. I want to be helpful, but I also don't want to be enabling. When I see someone asking for money, I go back and forth. Should I help? Should I not? The Bible says to give to those who ask you. The Bible also says that if you do not work, you should not eat. I get confused. So I do what I want to do. Nothing. I get confused, so I do what I want to do, which is nothing. I think a lot of us do that. We get confused, so we do nothing. Or we get confused, so we do what we want and not what God wants. But these things aren't really that confusing. The Bible says help the poor. If I'm not going to help this particular person, I guess that's fine. But I better have somebody else in mind that I'm going to help. The Bible says divorce is bad. The Bible says immigrants should be welcomed. The Bible says homosexuality is wrong. The Bible says we should forgive those who hurt us. We let ourselves get confused by the devil about things that aren't confusing. The serpent fosters confusion. Secondly, the serpent cultivates doubt. Cultivates doubt. So after the woman clarifies to the serpent the Lord's instruction, saying that they can't eat from the tree of knowledge because they will die... Satan retorts, you will not certainly die, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, what I got to point out here is that in a technical sense, 
the serpent is correct here. God tells the man and woman that if they eat from the tree, they will certainly die. They eat from the tree and they don't die. At least not immediately. Adam actually lives to the ripe old age of 930 years. I have no idea how that happened. CrossFit. <laughs> but also the serpent is right that in eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they actually become like God. They know things they didn't before. They become wise, like God. So the serpent is not wrong. They don't die, at least not immediately, and they become like God. But the serpent is telling half-truths here. He's not wrong, but he's not right. He's being very selective in his information. When Adam and Eve leave the garden, they lose access to the tree of life, and eventually they die in the wilderness. And yeah, while Adam and Eve do gain wisdom, like God, it's not a wisdom they're prepared to handle. Knowledge is power, and they don't know what to do with that knowledge. They're completely unprepared to handle the wisdom of God. It's like giving kids keys to a race car. And they just drive it all over the track. Psh, psh, psh. So the serpent tells them half-truths. But the net effect here is that the serpent is cultivating doubt in the woman's mind. What's he making her doubt? He's making her doubt God's goodness. He's making her doubt God's provision. He's suggesting to her that God is a liar and that God isn't telling her everything. He's making God seem jealous, impugning his motives, suggesting to her that God doesn't want them to eat from the tree of knowledge because he alone wants to be wise. That's what he says. For God knows, this is what the servant says, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like him. God knows that. God doesn't want that. God doesn't want you to be like him, so take this apple, stick it to the old man. Now, of course, this doesn't make any sense, right? Right? The Lord has shown himself to be only wise and generous here. He created the whole universe and put man and woman at the center of it. He created a garden and put the man there, man and woman there where they could live in perfect peace forever. What reason would they have to doubt God's character? He has shown himself only to be good and generous. We know what this is like, though. We know in our brains that God is trustworthy. We know that he is good, but we find a way to doubt we wonder if maybe God has been, you know, holding out on us. I think of this with respect to tithing. So we teach tithing here at Rooftop. We believe God's people should be giving at least 10% of their income to God's work. And that most of that should go to a person's local church family. We also believe that God has been good and gracious to us and that he rewards generosity in all kinds of ways. I mean, people who are radically generous tend to have everything they need and more. Am I right? Am I right? But giving 10% is hard. We're not used to it. A lot of us are in debt. And there are other things we think we need. A new car, a new room addition, a big wedding. So we look at the numbers and we think, this just is going to work. I mean, how is God going to take care of me? If I give away 10%, how is God going to take care of me? We doubt. We listen to the serpent. He's not going to take care of you. He doesn't actually love you. He has more to give you, but he's not giving it to you because he hates you. So keep your money. But it's not just tithing, it's anything. God tells us we have the strength to break addictions to alcohol and food and pornography, and we think, no, I don't. How's God going to take care of me without that stuff? God tells us we can handle a difficult relationship situation. And we think, no, I can't. Uh, here's a personal example. Uh, you know about this about me, but I have a hard time taking days off. I don't like taking days off. <laughs> because I feel like I'm going to fall behind. My, my, my sermon's not going to get done. I'm going to disappoint some people. I'm going to look unprepared. So I'll just have my computer out seven days a week. God tells me I don't need to and that the world will still go on if I don't get these things done. And I think, no, it won't. You're not that powerful that you can make things go without Matt Herndon. 
We think these things because the serpent is whispering in our ears, getting us to doubt the fundamental reality that God has given his children everything we need and we can be happy and cared for and relaxed if we just trust in what he has said. The serpent fosters confusion, cultivates doubt, and lastly, the serpent targets the vulnerable. He targets the vulnerable. I'm going to warn you that I've saved my most controversial point for last. So, buckle up. For thousands of years, readers of Genesis have wondered why the serpent addresses the woman. Not the man. As the author writes, he said to the woman. Some suggest uh, that the man isn't actually uh, present. Maybe he was out getting an oil change. I don't know. But in the next passage, we see that the man was there the whole time. Some people say that there's really no stated reason why the serpent targets the woman, and it would be foolish to speculate. I can actually really appreciate that. Some people argue that the serpent targets the woman because women are men's intellectual inferiors and he believes he will have better luck with her than him. Sadly, lots of Christians over history have actually concluded this. I don't accept that women are men's intellectual inferiors, nor does my wife. (laughs) Nor do I suspect many of you. There's just nothing in the text which suggests it should be interpreted like that. There's nothing here to suggest that Adam would do any better here. In fact, in the previous chapter, the author is explicit that God created the woman as man's equal, dividing the man into two halves. If anything, she is the one who arrives to rescue him. So then, why would the serpent target the woman? Well, there are actually some hints in the story, although they are subtle. So remember that in chapter 2, God gives the instructions to not eat from the tree of knowledge. He gives the instructions to not eat from the tree of knowledge to whom? The man. God tells the man that he can eat from any tree in the garden and not to eat from the tree of wisdom because if he does so, he will die. The woman hasn't been created yet. At this moment in the story, the woman has not been created. She's created later after God instructs the man. So, if the woman has heard God's instructions, she's gotten them from the man. And here's the thing. It looks like she has been given them or heard them incorrectly. Listen to how the woman replies to the serpent after he misquotes God. We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman said, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the trees in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. So for generations, scholars have pointed out there's an extra phrase there. You must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it. God never said anything about not touching the tree. Now maybe that was implied, maybe it wasn't. Either way, there seems to be a hint of frustration in the woman's explanation. Like, we can't even touch the tree. We can't even look at the tree. We can't even mention the tree. You get the impression that she's bothered by this. As though she were a fruit ready to be plucked. Now, if that's true, where did she get the idea that she can't even touch the tree? We're not exactly certain, but maybe the man. In fact, the Apostle Paul uses this very moment in the letter of Timothy to argue why the male teachers in his churches should be good teachers. Because the first man missed an important opportunity to teach his wife, leading her to sin. The man failed to properly convey the whole of God's teaching adequately. Now, there is lots to debate and discuss here. Here at Rooftop, we are a place where you can. But this is the best explanation I've heard about why the serpent targets the woman, because she hadn't met God yet. She hadn't heard the command from his mouth. And Adam hadn't done a very good job passing it along. 
He made God seem petty and something less than overwhelmingly generous. Take that for what it's worth, but the lesson here is that the serpent is aware of our vulnerabilities. He saw a vulnerability and he went after it. It's kind of like Hitler, that snake. He saw a beleaguered nation that had just been defeated and reduced to international slave status. He gave them something to feel good about, knowing they would be desperate enough to buy his racism and lies. This is what lots of leaders and politicians do. But again, it's not just Hitler, it's us. We need to recognize our own vulnerabilities. I mean, one way or another, the serpent looks at us and licks his chops. He knows where he can get us. He's smarter than us. I don't think Christians can be possessed by the devil or anything, but we're still impressionable. We can still be misled. I've heard it said to people in recovery, for example, that they need to avoid feelings of blast. You know what feelings of blast are? Feeling bored, lonely, angry, stressed, or tired. You got to avoid feeling bored, lonely, angry, stressed, or tired. Why? Because that's when we're vulnerable. I mean, when I'm angry at my wife, for example, that's when I'm most likely to notice somebody else. When I'm stressed out, that's when I'm most likely to yell at my kids. When I'm bored, that's when I'm most likely to waste time in front of the TV. We're all vulnerable. We're all kinds of vulnerable. The serpent knows this about us. He knows our vulnerabilities better than we do. How and when are you most vulnerable? When does Satan know he has the best chance with you? Now, what do we do with all this? This is what the serpent does, fosters confusion, cultivates doubt, targets the vulnerable. What do we do? Is there anything we can do? Are we doomed to disobedience and destined to be exiled from the garden? Well, the sad news is that, yes, we are doomed to disobedience and destined for exile. We've already been exiled from the garden. In Adam and Eve, we all had the chance to live forever, and they blew it. We blew it. In the words of John Steinbeck, we were all living east of Eden. What's even more frustrating, though, is that we continue to face temptation. You see, not satisfied with his victory, the serpent continues to manipulate us every day. He still wants to steal and kill and destroy. I think the devil believes that the more chaos he can sow in our lives and world, the more likely it is that we won't find our way back to Eden. And sure enough, every time we believe his lies and take another bite of the apple, we're just even further from God. So again, though, what do we do? Well, in a very real way, there's nothing we can do. There's nothing we can do against the devil. We're up against forces far beyond our power. I don't stand much of a chance against a supernatural talking snake. You don't stand much of a chance against a supernatural talking snake. But here's the thing, and this is really important. I'm not a Christian because I believe in myself. I'm a Christian because I don't. I'm a Christian because I believe in Jesus. And where I can't stand up against the devil, Jesus can. Jesus did. Maybe you know that early in Jesus' ministry, the slippery serpent tries these sneaky strategies again on a much bigger target. The Son of God arrives to earth to destroy the work of the devil, the power of sin and death. Before Jesus has even preached a sermon or healed a leper, he marches straight out to the wilderness to face down the serpent. Christians call this the temptation in the wilderness. And the devil tries all his old tricks. You can see him going down the list. He tries to confuse Jesus with the word of God, as though Jesus could be confused. He tries to cultivate doubt about God's goodness and care, as though Jesus could doubt those things. He tries to target Jesus' vulnerabilities, like hunger and thirst, as though Jesus isn't much stronger than he is vulnerable. And at the end of this 40-day test, the needle just hasn't moved. Matthew writes, Jesus said to him, Just get away from me, Satan. (laughs) For it is written, worship the Lord your God, serve him only. Then the devil left him and the angels came. So I can't resist the temptations of the devil and you can't resist the temptations of the devil, but we don't have to. We worship one who can. 
And we worship one who lives in us by the power of the Spirit, imbuing us with great power and strength. As we read last week in 2 Timothy, the Spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. And as John tells us in his first letter, you, dear children, are from God and have overcome because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. So I don't know what the, exactly the serpent is whispering to you, how he's tempting you, but here's how you resist, by remembering the one who turned the serpent away and now lives inside of you. Jesus can give you the power to do hard things. Jesus can give you the power to say no to lust and drink and greed. Jesus can give you the power to trust God with your time and with your money. Jesus can give you the power to love your spouse even when you don't want to. Jesus can give you the power to resist political and religious snakes using their own, using you for their own ends. Jesus can give you the power to do hard things. We know this because Jesus did the hardest. He did the hardest thing. He went to the cross to die for our sins. He knew that that was what was required so that we could be forgiven of our sins in the garden. He knew that's what we needed to happen so we could get back to Eden. He even told his disciples that he needed to do that. They couldn't imagine that was true though. His lead disciple Peter couldn't accept it. Mark writes that Peter took Jesus aside and rebuked him for it. Remember this scene? But maybe you know Jesus' response. What did he say? One more time. Get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of man. Jesus had it in himself to do hard things and would not let the devil throw him off. And that same power that kept Jesus focused on the cross, obedient to his Father, is living in us. And by the power of Jesus Christ at work in our lives, we can do hard things too.